Hi, let's talk about the esophagus. In this video, we'll discuss the parts of the esophagus, the pathway of the esophagus from the neck through to the abdomen, and how the esophagus is innervated. The esophagus is a muscular tube that spans the distance between the pharynx and the stomach. It's approximately 25 centimeters long, and if we were to divide it into thirds, the proximal third would be striated muscle, which is innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerves and served by the inferior thyroid arteries. And the distal two thirds would consist of smooth muscle under the control of the esophageal autonomic plexus and supplied by blood by bronchial and esophageal arteries. The first part of the esophagus is the cervical part, not pictured here. It runs from the laryngopharynx, which is transitioning into the esophagus at the opening of the esophagus at approximately the level of the cricoid cartilage, C6, which then at the root of the neck transitions into the thoracic part of the esophagus, which we can begin to, to see here. That thoracic part of the esophagus is then going to move through the posterior mediastinum, um, conveyed through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm, which is approximately at the level of T10, where it becomes the abdominal part of the esophagus, which terminates in the cardiac region of the stomach. So that cervical esophagus, um, which we can see here, is going to be contiguous with the laryngopharynx. So what I've just outlined is the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. That inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle has two parts. This part is the thyropharyngeal part, and below that is the cricopharyngeal part. Both of these parts originate in some portion of the larynx, either the thyroid or cricoid cartilage, and then meet their counterpart along the midline pharyngeal raphe. Both of these parts are part of the upper esophageal sphincter, and the cricopharyngeal part is the most significant component of that upper esophageal sphincter. The esophagus has two sphincters um, that are going to be able to control the size of the lumen. Uh, and this upper esophageal sphincter, it's important to note, is within the pharynx, not within the esophagus. So this precedes the esophagus. Nevertheless, this portion of the esophagus, the cervical part, is comprised of striated muscle, innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerves, and supplied by blood via the inferior thyroid arteries. Those are branches of the thyrocervical trunk of the first part of the subclavian artery. It's along these inferior thyroid arteries that will have branches from the cervical sympathetic ganglia sending out um, fibers along through paravascular plexuses of these inferior thyroid arteries. So these will be vasomotor fibers to control the, uh, the vasculature. At the root of the neck, the cervical esophagus transitions into the thoracic esophagus, and in the superior mediastinum, this will continue its association with the trachea with being behind or posterior to the trachea. As the trachea divides into the primary bronchi, um, the esophagus will continue inferiorly. We're now at the level of the posterior mediastinum. And we'll see that uh, the esophagus has a very close relationship with the posterior aspect of the pericardium, 
and therefore the heart, and it will be an intermediate between the azygous vein and the thoracic part of the descending aorta. And it's this relationship here that allows for transesophageal echocardiography and also um, imaging of the thoracic aorta from within the esophagus. Um, as we move into this region of the posterior mediastinum, the esophagus is now smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle is going to be under autonomic control. And the plexus, which controls that smooth muscle, is the esophageal plexus, which we'll talk about in greater detail. The esophagus is then going to be conveyed through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm at approximately the T10 level and will pick up as the abdominal part of the esophagus. But first, let's discuss this esophageal plexus. There are inputs, both parasympathetic and sympathetic, to this autonomic plexus. The parasympathetics are going to be the dominant fiber within the plexus as the vagus nerves, here we see the left vagus nerve, become the vagal trunks. So we'll have an anterior and a posterior vagal trunk. The anterior is predominantly comprised of left vagus fibers with some right. The posterior is predominantly comprised of right vagus fibers with some left. And the greatest effect that the parasympathetics will have on the esophagus is that of peristalsis, or wave-like rhythmic contractions of the esophagus, so as to encourage the distal propulsion of food materials down toward the stomach. Any associated visceral afferent fibers with these parasympathetic fibers are going to be feedback to the autonomic nervous system or reflex involved. The sympathetic fibers uh, are going to originate from preganglionic fibers. So these will be white rami communicantes at the level of ventral primary rami of thoracic nerves T4 through T6. Typically, the superior two ganglia, so four and five, are going to send fibers up to the cervical sympathetic ganglia, and those will be involved in the paravascular plexuses that route out along the inferior thyroid arteries. The postganglionic fibers will come from a variety of sources. So there will be some branches from the middle and inferior cervical uh, ganglia, but most of those fibers will stay local and remain as vasomotor fibers of the paravascular plexuses along the inferior thyroid arteries. Some may descend down uh, toward the cardiac plexus and beyond, as we know that there is significant communications between cardiac, pulmonary, and esophageal plexuses. And then there will be direct branches from T4 to T6 ganglia uh, out to the esophageal plexus, as there will be communications of cardiac branches from superficial and deep cardiac plexuses as well. In terms of the response, uh, the effects of sympathetic innervation will be vasoconstriction, much like nearly all other uh, sympathetic effects on vasculature. Any associated visceral afferent fibers with sympathetic fibers will conduct visceral pain fibers back. Visceral pain is very difficult to localize and it's felt uh, differently than somatic pain. And since these are being conducted along T4 to T6, and these are also serving the cardiac plexuses, um, any esophageal pain might be felt as burning or dull pain around the heart. Hence the, the term heartburn when associated with uh, esophageal injury from acid reflux from the stomach. Then finally, the most distal part of the esophagus is the abdominal part, which is conducted 
uh, through the esophageal hiatus. We can see that esophageal hiatus here. Um, and we can also see the anterior vagal trunk located here, as well as the posterior vagal trunk located there. That abdominal esophagus is going to deviate to the left, and it's going to empty into the cardiac region of the stomach, and it's therefore going to sometimes be referred to as the cardiac sphincter or the gastroesophageal sphincter. This is the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, this is supplied by uh, branches from the left inferior phrenic artery, not seen here, as well as the left gastric artery, which is a branch of the celiac trunk, which we'll discuss in much greater detail in the GI sessions. So we've discussed the parts of the esophagus, the different types of muscle which comprise the wall of the esophagus, the blood supply to the esophagus, and the innervation to the esophagus, both of the somatic recurrent laryngeal nerves as well as the esophageal plexus and the vagal and sympathetic trunk inputs to that plexus. This is your summary slide. Thank you for your time.